Roughly two weeks ago, we talked about how the evictions now across the United States are moving past pre-pandemic levels now that all the eviction moratoriums are over and things are sort of getting back to normal and non-paying tenants are finally going to get kicked to the curb. Now, one of the big effects that happens from that is obviously homelessness, but the other side of the coin that a lot of people don't think about that you don't consider that's going to be an ugly side effect from this as well is squatters. Now, in case you don't know what a squatter is, it's basically when somebody illegally moves into a place that they're not supposed to live in. So, you know, if I move into this house next to me here and I just break in while the owners are gone and I stay living there, I'm considered a squatter. I'm not paying them rent, I don't own the place, but I'm in the house even though I'm not supposed to be. And come to find out, apparently squatting is becoming a political movement from the left, which I had no idea there was a political angle for people becoming squatters today. But really the big reason why people are becoming squatters is because number one, they're professional criminals. And the other thing is when people don't have a place to live, if they get evicted, they might get desperate and resort to doing something like this. In fact, there was a story from a guy in Long Island, New York, and get this, he has not paid his mortgage for 25 years. The mortgage was foreclosed, but the company that now owns the home has struggled for decades to evict this guy, and basically what he's doing is he keeps changing lawyers and filing lawsuits to delay the proceedings. Now, I don't know how the court system can overlook something like this and let somebody get away with not paying the mortgage for 25 years just because they keep changing lawyers or filing lawsuits or whatever. That sounds insane. And this is happening in New York. And similarly, another story in New York, there's a 90-year-old rabbi and he allowed a 67-year-old woman to move in with him temporarily because she became homeless during the pandemic. And now she just refuses to leave. She won't go, guys. <laughs> I mean, what would you do in a situation like this where you were being kind, you invite somebody into your home in order to give them shelter and then turn around and screw you like this and they won't leave? Here's another instance right out of Florida where these people had a house in Sarasota, Florida and they took off on vacation. When the squatter moved in and refused to leave, the squatter said that they actually had a lease for the house and eventually she was arrested, but then right away, they just let her go. So she was arrested, got out of jail pretty much right away, and then she came back and stole the person's car. And the police said that probably nothing's gonna be done about this person, and they're probably not gonna get in any further trouble from this. I mean, how insane is that, guys? The people who are doing this are committing all sorts of crimes, like fraud, forgery, breaking and entering, all of these things, but yet they're not being prosecuted. And since when do we not prosecute things like this? Like, why are these people not being charged? Why are they not being arrested? Why are they not, you know, being thrown in jail over this? Apparently all that needs to happen is police and prosecutors just need to enforce the existing laws that are on the books. The problem is no one's enforcing the laws. I mean, I remember when I was a kid how you know, you would see these things on TV, different movies or these crime shows talking about how people get in big trouble when they do things, you know, they're going to, to jail for robbing a bank or killing somebody or doing something serious that, you know, ultimately should land someone in jail. And now it seems like today, it's like lawlessness all over the place. People are just getting away with doing whatever they want for the most part. Now, one thing they're saying that cities and prosecutors and police can do to basically effectively enforce these type of things right away is treat it just like any other type of crime. Like if somebody broke into your car and was trying to steal it and the cops showed up, then they would arrest the person on the spot and they would be going to jail. But why is doing the same thing with someone's house and their personal property that they own, why is that not accepted as the same level of crime. This is even worse in a lot of ways. You know, if someone's trying to steal your car, all you gotta do is prove to the police like, yeah, I own this car, here's my insurance information, here's a copy of my title, you know, go get this guy. Now, out of New York, there was 
a lady that was trying to get a tenant or a squatter, I should say, not a tenant, evicted for three years and no luck. Even though this person had uh, fraudulently signed a lease and made everything up, it was all just make-believe, Forbes signatures, the whole nine yards, doesn't matter. They ended up making it so that this person could not get evicted and kick this person out of the house, okay? This person is such a fraud that they used their deceased father and sister's name on this lease paperwork and forged their name. So this person signed the names of a dead person and claimed that, yeah, uh, you know, we're allowed to live here. We're putting this all together on the lease like it's all legitimate, even though it's all a complete fraud. And to add to the fraud, this squatter actually was able to turn on the utilities in the house, you know, the water, the electricity, everything like that, probably using fake names and social security numbers as well. When this person, the squatter, was finally arrested, the city hit the owner of the property with a $25,000 unpaid water bill. I mean, how criminal is that, guys? We're talking about people losing the rights to their own property here and getting stuck with a major bill like this that someone else ran up and you can prove that there was a squatter living in the property the whole time and the city's not going to be on your side as the homeowner and help do something about this that is insane i mean i have no idea what can even be done about a situation like this but i would definitely be getting in touch with a lawyer asap because there's no way that the owner of this property should be responsible for this twenty-five thousand dollar water bill that is just criminal and you know on top of that you have the city and the county and still they still want their property tax money you know if you don't pay then they'll take the house away from you it's bad enough if you got a squatter in there but you still got to pay the property taxes while there's a squatter in there right i mean there should be some kind of workaround with this guys like there's no way that people should be on the hook for paying utilities and property taxes when there's a known squatter in the house and it can be proved it's not a sham you know something that you have proof of but yet there's just no recourse for owners on this and the worst part is the Democrats in Congress are trying to pass a law where you're basically barring landlords from learning whether or not potential tenants have criminal records which would actually increase the likelihood of you renting out your place to a known criminal a known sex offender and most importantly a known squatter somebody who has been charged for this in the past. I mean, how crazy is this? I feel like everything is so upside down when you read stories like this, that literally people who pay for their property taxes, they bought the property fair and square, their hard earned money, you know, they're not stealing anything from anyone, are the people that are getting shafted with this right now. This is literally upside down world where the criminals and people who are doing everything possibly wrong are getting the upper hand essentially and people who are trying to do everything right are getting screwed and i don't think that's going to last forever guys because people can only take so much of this bs before it all boils over and people will start taking matters into their own hands that's what i think is going to happen because honestly if i was in this situation that's probably what i would do I wouldn't be calling the cops if you know what I mean. And you know what the excuse is for prosecutors or why they don't prosecute people like this? They don't want to be uh, looked at in a negative political light because it looks like you're targeting people who are homeless. What? This is not about homelessness. This is about who's a criminal and who's not. I mean, anybody who can't see past that is so involved with their own political motive and gain in life that they just have no regard for anyone right now. All they care about is getting richer and, you know, why do they care if people are stealing from you? Because they're stealing from you also by not prosecuting people like this and taking our tax money and getting paid to do nothing. In a way, these prosecutors are squatters themselves. They, they hold an office, you know, they're supposed to put people behind bars for doing the wrong thing, but instead they don't because of their own political agenda. How wrong is that? It sounds like it's more than just the squatters who need to be evicted. Now, obviously, there's not a whole lot you can do to prevent getting into a squatter situation other than be really good at screening your tenants. So first of all, guys, if you're a landlord and 
you know, you don't have a lot of experience or you're not planning on being very hands-on, it is crucial that you hire a property manager that can screen tenants on your behalf that does this every day and knows what to look for. And I found this quick legal roundup of things that you can actually use to deny someone from moving into uh, your property without discriminating against them. So the first thing is income to rent ratio. If someone doesn't have the proper income to rent ratio that you're looking for as a tenant, you can deny them from moving in. And obviously if it's too low, that might be a red flag that they might not be able to afford it anyways. Another one is too many occupants. Now landlords cannot decide how many people get to live in a property, but the local government does. Like here in Miami, for example, I can't remember the details, but like for a one bedroom apartment, for example, I think is you're not allowed to have more than three people living in that. Same thing with a two bedroom place. I think you're not allowed to have more than four or five people and so on and so forth. So the, the county sets limits on this. And if you have someone applying for your place that's trying to go beyond this limit, that's grounds for denial as well. Also, bad credit. If you check someone's credit report and you're not happy with what you find, you can deny them. And very important here is unpaid balances and evictions. If someone has an eviction on their record or they have unpaid bills on their credit report, you can say no to them. Also, if they have any sort of collections going on or unpaid balances in the place they used to live, you can deny them for that as well. And you can also deny them for lying on the application. If they give you false or unverifiable information, that's grounds for denial as well. So you still have rights as a landlord of things you can do to weed out the bad apples. But sometimes it just can't be prevented, guys. Like you do have people who are career criminals that do this over and over and over again. I've seen news stories about this time and time again where people end up squatting in a place for as long as possible. Usually what happens is the landlord is eager to get a tenant or the landlord is just won over by the, the people, right? Because they act so nice and so kind and they seem like they're gonna be the best tenants ever. But as soon as the first rent payment is due, that's when things start to fall apart. Now, if you guys are enjoying this video, please make sure you give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps out tremendously every single time you do that. Now, switching over to more a uh, broader housing market here. Now that things have been heating up during the spring and summer selling season, this might be a problem for the Fed, okay? They already paused their interest rate hike at the last meeting, and most betting markets are predicting that they're going to raise rates again here in July. And right now, the new house market is totally on fire. Builders are reporting their foot traffic has nearly doubled in the past six months. Home sellers are reporting 3.3 offers on average. That's up from 2.2 offers as of December of 2022. But like I said, this is the busy home selling season, so that's not really that big of a surprise, especially with how low the inventory is. You have whoever is out there competing for basically the lowest amount of inventory we've had in many, many years, possibly even ever. The National Association of Realtors likes to look at this as a recovery, but I'm willing to bet that when the data comes out, by the time we see the data for July or August, we're gonna st start seeing home prices come back down again. But since the Fed is always looking at lagging data, they may end up hiking interest rates even further than people think because of how high inflation is going when it, when it comes to housing. And housing is one of the biggest factors that contributes to inflation. And we know that the Fed's goal is to get to a 2% inflation rate. And economists are estimating housing inflation would need to come down to about 3.3% annually in order to get the Fed closer to its 2% overall inflation target. Well, as of May, the rent growth which they use to measure housing inflation was at 8.7%. And for owners, people who own property, it's at 8%. So still far higher than the 3% that they would likely need to get it down to, which could suggest more rate hikes coming throughout the rest of the year that people are not anticipating right now. We saw the most recent inflation numbers come out last week and it didn't go down. It actually went up just a tiny, tiny little bit I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something around like 4.3% and before it was maybe 4.1%. So it went up ever so slightly, but it's not going in the right direction for the Fed right now. 
So people can celebrate all they want that, oh, the housing market's in recovery and everything's going to be beautiful and home prices are just going to surge on up forever. Well, the Fed might not let that happen in the long run if they look at this and say, well, this is a problem and we got to do something about it before it's too late. But there is one interesting twist to these interest rate hikes that might not be considered or might not be looked at because basically the idea of the interest rate hikes is okay it makes buying a home less affordable so the higher the mortgage rates are the less buyers that we're going to see in the market which generally is true because you know we see the mortgage applications at pretty much 40 year lows right now and the data reflects that the buyer demand has fallen off a cliff but you still do have a lot of cash buyers out there that are not affected by interest rates that have a lot of money to burn. The other effect that high interest rates have on the housing market is that it slows down home building and development, okay? Because builders rely on floating rate debt in order to acquire and build new developments. So the higher the interest rates are, the more cost it's gonna be for them to potentially develop any sort of project which will probably lower the amount of projects that are going to be taken on as well as make the ones they do take on more expensive which would increase the cost of a new home more than where it's at right now. So one twisted dynamic that could actually come out of these higher interest rates is that it might actually make the housing affordability problem even worse by restricting supply even further because we might see builders slowing down, not building as much because they can't find many land deals that are as profitable to move forward with. And at the same time, whatever they do build is more expensive because it costs them more to build, number one, and number two, because inventory has been kept suppressed due to the fact that there's just been less building. So how ironic is that? And this is even more important today than it has been in the past because in the past, typically new home sales account for 10 to 15% of the sales each year. Well, right now, new home builds roughly account for 30% of all the housing inventory on the market. So having home builders slow down would be a huge hiccup for the housing market right now. And that's the ironic thing, guys. The, the higher the interest rates go, the more the home building could potentially slow down, which in a strange way could keep housing prices higher for longer. And the real scary part about that is the Fed does not have any other tools in its toolbox besides raising rates. You know, they can raise rates and raise rates, but honestly, I think because they only have raising rates as their only tool in the toolbox, that they're probably gonna have to go much higher with rates than they ever thought that they would to really drag things down because they need to make rates high enough where we have a stock market crash, where unemployment goes up you know, close to double digit numbers again like it did during the last uh, recession. It needs to make a major splash in the economy because if it doesn't, then it's not gonna have the desired effect. And of course, they don't wanna do that because that makes them look very bad you know, having people lose their jobs, having foreclosures shoot up and delinquencies rise and everything that comes along with it is not good for business in terms of, you know, getting reelected or your political career or whatever. Just like these prosecutors that don't want to prosecute squatters, these people at the Fed and the government don't want to crash the economy because it makes them look bad, even though it could actually end up being the right thing and the healthy thing to do in the long term to get things back more in line with uh, historical norms and become stable again. So my personal opinion is when I look at this and I see just how much uh, housing inflation is up over just the regular CPI numbers, it's practically double. I think the Fed still has a long ways to go in order to bring inflation back down, especially now that it's just already creeping back up guys even with the rate hikes basically if they don't do that i think they're risking not only having inflation going back up to where it was previously when it was you know at the nine percent mark or whatever but also just making things far worse whenever they actually decide to crash it you know like they gave out all this money during the pandemic they didn't want the all-out economy crash then right okay great now it's time to fix it well we're kind of scared to do what's necessary to fix it so we're just going to kind of like 
nudge it along and see if that works. Well, it's not working. What's the next step? To me, the only logical next step is they need to go full steam ahead and interest rates need to be 10%. You know, it's only 5% right now. Now that might be extreme, but I'm just saying that as an example, like it's time to really start ramping up where the interest rates are so we can start seeing the effect on this. I mean, if there's gonna be any sort of crash in the economy or whatever, why bring it on slowly and painfully, guys? Might as well just rip off the Band-Aid and let it happen quicker, because the quicker it happens, the quicker we can start to recover from it. So that's my outlook on it anyways. Let me know what you guys think. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't want to wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.